I'm at Salem's Riverfront Park and I'm watching them. This is about the fourth or fifth day. They are building this ice rink down here. They do this uh, temporarily. This is the second year they put this ice rink, skating rink, in basically downtown Salem. They build this, they have it up for the winter months, and then they take it down and and reseed the grass like nothing's ever happened. But they've you know got this process to do all of that. And and I got to thinking about processes uh, when it comes to pretty much everything you do. Uh, there's a process to this vlog slash podcast I do. I have a little intro. I, if I usually have a guest, I, I include that. Then I have like a trade show tip. That's part of the process. It's a formula. And then end with one good thing, which we'll do again this time. Uh, but we also uh, look at processes from a lot of different angles. So what works, what doesn't, how do you break it up, how do you change it? Because, you know, you want to be flexible and adaptable. Uh, we got into a great conversation. Robert Strong and I did this episode of the Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Robert's a magician slash professional presenter. And he got to talking about the adaptability which makes you successful in that industry and how you really help bring in leads for trade show clients at trade shows. It's a really a fun conversation and I hope you enjoy it here. I'd like to welcome to Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee, Robert Strong, strongtradeshows.com and full-time mag magician and a professional trade show presenter. Robert, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. I, I appreciate your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do in the trade show world. Sure. So I'm a full-time magician. I've been doing magic since I was 12 years old. And uh, about 2007, I was asked to uh, perform at VMware and it opened my eyes. And uh, uh, I learned that with my magic, I can convey really great messaging through uh, metaphors using the magic. And uh, booths that had uh, a handful of people in the audience suddenly had standing room only. So it was a really great match. I got to I got to do the magic. Uh, they got to get big crowds, and it was a win-win all around. So, when you're doing this uh, presentation on stage, you're using magic. Uh, how much of the the you know you got to balance between the the client's message versus the magic? How does that all work out? And 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 obviously, you've you've learned over the years what works and what doesn't. What kind of thoughts do you have on on that approach? There's not just one single approach. I do lots of interviews with a client and try to clearly define their goals find out if it's lead count, if it's making their booth a spectacle, if it's about qualifying very specific leads, if it's uh, filling the theater for their uh, expert presentations, and then we craft a presentation just for them. So um, typically what happens is uh, between you and me and hopefully the rest of the world, um, <laughs> the most important thing, if you get one thing from this whole presentation, no one wants to be in, any other, in anyone else's booth for more than five to 10 minutes. Right. When presentations start going to 20, 25 minutes, everybody's checking their smartphones and their watches, and, and um, it should have wrapped up a long time ago. So what I do is in a very short amount of time, get a very big crowd, push the information in there, get them qualified, hand those people over to salespeople so they can start the uh, conversation to be in the funnel for sales. Um, so what I do is I'll probably do two magic tricks, very fast, lightning fast, and uh, maybe I'll do a card trick that's just for them. We talk about how the product's customized. And I'll turn ones to hundreds to talk about return on investment for this product. It's strange, no matter what trade show you are in, <laughs> it's all about the customization, the artificial intelligence. It's all about the um, uh, uh, the fact that you get a best ROI. So, I mean, it's very easy for me to get that messaging in. And, and the fact of the matter is, we're still fascinated as people who oh, don't. I, I'm not a magician, and but I, I'm fascinated by the act of doing that. And so you stop and you look, and and that draws attention. And as we know. Any small crowd makes a bigger crowd, especially in a place where there's lots of people milling around. Yeah, and I would guess talks, Andrew, okay. you've interviewed talks about pattern disruption, yeah. and it's really great. You walk down the trade show floor, and people say, "Can I help you?" Uh, and people say, "No, thank you." Where's the bathroom? And when you do something <laughs> that's just out of the ordinary, people will stop in their tracks and they will watch. And like you said, a crowd gets a bigger crowd. If you got one person on the street corner pointing up, everybody thinks they're crazy. But if you have thirty people everybody stops. Exactly. So my job is to get the first 30 in there. So is, when it comes to, uh, actually, what you, you, you obviously do something pretty short, five to seven minutes, I'm guessing, uh, in that neighborhood. Um, you have to coordinate with a bunch of, they've got to have, the, the, the client has got to have a bunch of people that are prepared for that. So what kind of conversation does that bring to you and, and the client when you're doing like the pre-show organization? How, how do you let them know what they need to do on their end? 
So what we do is we'll, once we make a plan, once we find out the goals, then we make a plan, then we do a booth training and the booth training is so, so pivotal. So I'll just give you one example because they all unfold so differently. I do an incredibly large amount of work with Lenovo, um, kind of a spokesperson for them. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to fill the theater seats completely full so that their experts can come in and talk. Often they're uh, customers, so they want to make sure that they have an alert audience, an audience that's ready to hear the messaging and are going to ask a lot of questions afterwards. So for example, we'll have a very small giveaway for each person who comes and sees the show. We might have a raffle at the end of the presentation. We'll have the raffle tickets. We'll have crowd gatherers. We'll have uh, literature that's on the seats. Uh, we'll have a nice uh, a screenshot that attracts people that tells them exactly what they're going to see and things like this specifically. The crowd gatherers gives everybody a raffle ticket. The raffle ticket is worth about one one hundredth of a penny, maybe a thousandth of a penny. That anchors them to the end of the presentation. Then we might do a small raffle for a small little gift, a $10 little gift, a $10 Starbucks gift card. And then what we do is we say, Every uh, SE, every uh, demonstration pedestal, every expert, every salesperson that's in our booth has a gift to give you. All you have to do is approach any of them and ask them a question about the presentation or hear the one minute product demo, and then you can trade that ticket for a small gift. And the gift could be as small as a pen, it could be as, as if they're a qualified lead, it could be a, a Yeti or, or a sweatshirt or a jacket right. or something like that. But the other thing is, is after they've watched the presentation and they've gone over the ticket, I sometimes give them these things. This is, hey, we can give you all the product information in 90 seconds, start the presentation, and a lot of times they'll figure out in a minute, they can get all the information they need to get in there, and then it can take longer if the people have questions. But again, um, keeping it short is not just to take care of the customer, it's because of opportunity cost. If, if somebody's spending 25 minutes with a single customer, um, there's all the people who are streaming by the booth that they're not talking to. Yeah, you miss them, yeah, yeah. You miss them. And then the other thing I really train them to do is how to scale because if you're going to take 90 seconds to talk about uh, data centers or, 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 or security, um, you might as well be talking to 20 people instead of one person because it's so expensive to be at a, a conference. You want to make the most value out of it. So I help the uh, sales team. I'm not just doing the presentations. I'm not just filling the seats. I'm helping the sales team get the most value out of the the, the cost of sending the salespeople there. There's not just the hotels and the, and the airfare and, and all that. It's also they're not at work doing regular work. So there's that other opportunity cost. So I really try to drive that home. Yeah, I love that you guys go from like basically soup to nuts. You you've got the the beginning of the presentation. You and and you've got the whole trail from from getting people attracted to sitting down to watching you or whoever's doing it to the follow through and all that because that that's a lot of thought and organization and the process is really good. I, I've I've seen things like that, but a lot of companies will miss a step here and there and people will filter away and so you miss it. But but if you're doing, you're following I mean, all that through. Yeah, go, go ahead. They miss a step. It is shocking <laughs> that people will spend a, a quarter of a million, a million dollars to be there and no one will think of an opening line. Right. Let's talk about opening lines because uh, yeah. uh, you and I actually met for, for lunch in Vegas last year uh, with a friend of ours, Anders, yes. and he invited me down. We met. It was, it was a fun lunch with you and a bunch of other presenters. But um, uh, one of the, the interesting things that I saw that made me want to get you on is that I saw you just recently doing a, a, like a YouTube video for some other uh, company that was in opening lines. You were asking people, what's your opening line at a show? And it was really eye-opening. So let's yeah. talk about that. What, what kind of things work? What kind of things don't work? What, how, why did you ask that question? So this is so important. So my friend David Spark wrote a great book. I think it's uh, uh, Six Feet from Seven Figures, or I might have the title a little bit off, but um, we can find it and add a link. And uh, in our conversations, in our lunches, I just will rant and, you know, do the, the head slap of, you know, wow, um, they've spent so much time, energy, and money to be here, but they haven't even figured out how to qualify a lead, or they haven't uh, come up with case studies, or they haven't come up with uh, how to get the uh, pitch in 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 90 second chunks, and then most importantly, just the opening line. Uh, for engineers especially, it's not so easy for them to stand at the edge of the booth and to wrangle people in. Yeah. That's nothing they're interested in doing. It's nothing they're trained to do. It's actually they're practically allergic to it. And so uh, what we do is we talk about how to physically approach them, not just the words that they say. Um, kind of like uh, what we said, Anders pattern disruption. You know, you come in at a 45 degree angle, so it's not aggressive, so you're not coming straight in. You don't come from behind because that's kind of scary. 
So little things like that, social cues, not everybody has those. And uh, specifically for trade shows. And then for the opening lines, I'll always ask, what's a great opening line? And people say, how are you doing? Can I help you? And those are the worst opening lines. It's, it's, it's like seeing a hippie with a clipboard outside of a grocery store. When you see that, you have all this time in the world to say, no, thank you. I've got to go home and take care of the kids or I've got to make dinner. <laughs> and so what you want to do is you want to uh, keep reducing rejection so it's always approaching zero. So something uh, like everybody loves giving an opinion. One of the best openers is what's the most interesting thing you've seen at this trade show? And then you see what's top of mind. Then you realize that they're interested in security or they're interested in cloud computing or they're interested in um, uh, some, some other thing, hybrid uh, computing or internet of things or edge computing. Um, I, obviously, I do a lot of tech trade shows. Right. Another great opening line is, what's your job title? You can find out right away, if they're, right away if they're marketing or if they're sales or if they're engineers or if they're CTO or CIO or you know what, what their job is. And then you can structure what you're going to say towards what their job titles. You go, I know what your biggest pain point is. It's this, and we have a solution for it. Um, another one is what is your biggest pain point in your industry? And they're there. They're physically flew across country to try to solve a big pain point. Right. They threw a lot of time, energy, and money at it. So just ask them, and then you can tailor it. And then likewise, if there's nothing in your booth that is a solution for them, you tell them, we have nothing here that solves your problem. We have a different slice of the industry. I'm going to scan you anyways because you're obviously an influencer, and we'd love to keep in touch. We never know where you're going to land in three years. So you scan them anyways because um, – over time, people do become customers because their industry grows or they become an influencer. Or they, or they may know someone they can refer to you, you know, because exactly. if you leave, leave them with a good impression, even though they're not a, a, a potential prospect right then, and, you can disengage politely and, and, and they can refer someone to you like next week, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. Not only disengage politely, but disengage quickly. Again, opportunity costs. You, while you're talking to that, um, that person, there's 15 people streaming by behind them and Andy Sachs, um, has one of the best uh, ways of training internal people. What he says is he says, imagine every person walking by has a price tag that's literally sitting over their head. So the cost of a lifetime of a customer might be $50,000 or $500,000. You imagine every person walking by has that number above their head. And if you don't engage with them, you're letting that money just go by without even checking in to see if they're qualified. Right. So it, it lights a fire under their backside. It just is the perspective. I, I love that. Uh, putting, putting that sort of flashing red light in your mind on there. <laughs> That's great. So, um, you know, what, what are there industries that work better for in booth presentations than others? I, I, the reason I ask is because tech seems to be uh, the sweet spot for that. But uh, I am at a natural products food show every year. And I, I rarely, if ever, see a presenter there. Uh, people they're about the food, they're about the samples and that sort of thing. And they're 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 it's a little different, but I would think that a good presenter at that type of, of show could be effective. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, well, I want to I want to kind of identify what a good presenter is, right? <laughs> and also say um, that yeah, presenters will always add value to the shows if they're a good presenter. And I'd say there's really one exception: um, B to C, business to customer. Right. Those tend to be just selling products and it's about making money in the booth. And I find that a good product sells and a, uh, a, uh, a, a presenter can be in the way. Now I would, s I'm actually going to unsay all that with the next thing I'm going to say, if we define what a good presenter is, is, um, you know what? I'm going to be more honest. I don't think most of us like doing business to customer shows. <laughs> I, I, I think that's probably maybe a little more honest. Um, we like to do the B2B shows. Okay, so um, what a good presenter is, is a lot of things. They know how to use the microphones, they know how to write a script, they know how to draw people in. Um, if you're a variety performer like me, that means you have experience doing kids' birthday parties because of the ADD. Uh, people have the smallest attention spans at trade shows. They've done comedy clubs because they can deal with any kind of like heck or anything that's thrown at them you know, sideways. Uh, they've done street performing, meaning they can be the most interesting thing in the world and get people to stop in their tracks. Um, those are some things that define a good presenter, but not all of us are variety guys. There are right. a lot of great presenters that are, are um, actors and speakers and, and uh, even uh, technical people and engineers that do it. Here's what defines a good presenter. Someone who can adapt. 
because every minute in a trade show floor is different than the one before and every hour is different than the one before and every day has its own personality. Every city has its own personality and all that. So you'll see, you're at a lot of tech trade shows, you'll see a lot of the same people, but there's other industries uh, with other presenters that I never run into because they're doing the, um, you know, the construction and blue collar kind of trade shows. And then there's the home building and then there's the, the finance and legal trade shows. There's um, apparently 1,200 trade shows in the United States every week. Yeah, it doesn't surprise and me. Tens so of thousands I, a year, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been at the ones that are, where I'm the only magician, I'm the only presenter, and it really works. Those like, um, those uh, chemistry biology shows that was a lot of university people and all that. You can be in a big conference center like Moscone and you hear a pin drop. It, yeah. Those shows are so quiet. You got a lot of people with tabletops and they, they got their posters and they just talk one-on-one -on -one to people. So what will happen is I'll go there and I'll be in a booth that has a one one hundredth of the budget of like Thermo Fisher. And I will have a crowd of a hundred people in a 10 by 10 and Thermo Fisher will have an engineer occasionally talking to one person at a time. So a good presenter goes in and adapts and look goes, what, what in this situation is going to make it work? And when you make a plan months in advance and you spend all your time, energy and money in it, a bad presenter will stick to the plan. If it's not working, a good presenter will, will read the situation, keep trying differently until they, they get it right. But someone who's experienced won't have to try very hard or very differently. They'll look at the situation and know exactly what the right thing to do is. And an example is, is, um, a big deep theater and there's low attendance because everybody's at the keynote and they've got a presenter they need to get fill the seats so um a, a inexperienced presenter will stand there on stage and keep trying to get a crowd someone that's experienced will pick up their stuff or pick themselves up walk to the edge just talk to a few people get a crowd of five do a magic trick get a crowd of 15 and then walk them into the theater and i've seen a lot of people that are very talented not have the uh the adaptability skill, the, the flexibility skill. Interesting, the adaptability skill. Yeah, one, uh, one last thing, Robert, and, and, and I'm curious because hiring a presenter is a cost, and, and sometimes with all the time that gets involved, it, it's a cost that a lot of exhibitors may say, you know, I just don't know that I can do that. So what is the advantage of doing that? And, and the, the part two of that is if they're deciding to do that, what do they have to do on their end to make sure that it, they have all the follow-through stuff? So you may want to, I may ask you to rephrase the last question, make sure I understand it. But yeah. Well, let's see, they're going to hire you, but they've got to also bring some stuff to the table, which means that if you're bringing a crowd in, they've got to know how to deal with the crowd. Gotcha. Okay, I understand. Um, so typically when you bring me in, and I can't speak for all presenters, uh, the number of scans or leads you get goes up 10 times. And that is an immense number. I mean, the carpet's expensive, the Wi-Fi is expensive, the uh, uh, you know having coffee in your booth is expensive. All these things have incredibly high markup um, because it's a trade show and they can they can do it. Yeah. Um, compared to all those things, those things don't get scans. Those things don't get leads. Um, what I do is it's my job to make sure everybody we engage with is scanned, and I'm focused on that, and I'm external. And I don't work again if I'm not successful at that. The internal people have the feeling of stability and security, and they're not as motivated. And if it lands in their lap, they'll do the scan, but they're not chasing, you know, qualified leads. So, um, so that's what they get for hiring me as someone who is proactive and typically gets a tenfold increase. Tenfold is huge. It is. And if you add um, a. Uh, a screen, a video screen in your booth that has a looped video that gives all the benefits and features of your product. The screen itself, you're looking at five to twelve thousand dollars, depending on the size of the screen. Then you're looking at another ten to fifteen thousand dollars for the production of video, plus all the time to produce it. And I can't tell you that I've ever seen an IBM or Dell or Google a video screen that's unattended get one single lead or scan. I can't even tell you that I've ever seen a person stop and watch the video all the way through. And so there is just so much waste. It's really about talking to someone like me and figuring out how to reallocate funds so the money spent actually leads to sales, leads to the pipeline being filled. Um, and then what do they need to do um, to, to get the most value out of me? I walk them through the process and it's specifically having very, very clear messaging. If you have uh, uh, 35 seconds with a person and you want them to leave and remember something, what is that? Make sure it's clear and it's in, in, 
and plain English, not not jargon, not engineer talk. Um, the second thing is is to be very clear about um, who your customer is, or your customer is, because I can ask qualifying questions, and if I've got an audience of 150 people, I can identify the the 10 people who make the buying decision and introduce those people to salespeople. And studies have shown that it takes three to five points of contact before somebody brings right. a customer. So it becomes a customer and spends money. So I'm the first point of contact and I introduce them to uh, one demonstration person, they introduce them to a salesperson and there's three or four contacts on the first day. So when they follow up, they feel like they're already connected and familiar with the, the product, the company and the team. And um, yeah, it's, it's really about understanding and communicating to me uh, what the product does and communicating to me, communicating to me who buys the product and then uh, making the in booth plan and just following through with it and doing the training, the role playing is really important because people don't do trade shows every day all year long. But when you get in the muscle memory and they realize after they do their demo, the next thing they need to do is make another introduction within the booth. If they're a qualified lead and you practice it six or eight times, then the people do it. And, and I would say that there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of bars to get to that success level, but boy, once you get there, uh, you realize that trade shows can just bring you new markets. They can open up doors that you have never done before. And you look back and you go, man, it was expensive, but look what we got out of it. And, and yeah. having a professional presenter, I've seen it work. And uh, I really appreciate your sharing your insight, Robert. Um, Robert Strong with uh, strongtradeshows.com. Is that the best place to find you? Other things That's we mentioned about? Yeah, that's the best place to find me. Uh, that's okay. good. I'm really happy to spend some time with you. Thank you for your right. for uh, interviewing me. All right. Well, I hope to see you again soon in person. Thanks, Robert. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Robert Strong for joining me on this week's Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Had a lot of fun. Uh, like I mentioned during the interview, I met uh, Robert once in person, uh, Las Vegas, middle of last year. Hope to do that again at some point. Uh, this week's Trade Show Tip of the Week comes from my book, Trade Show Superheroes and Exhibiting Zombies. It's a chapter called 10 Reasons to Share Content Online from Your Trade Show Appearance. So let's, uh, you know, take a look at a few of these. Easy to point a camera, take a photo, take a video like we're doing right here. So, uh, but can you think of more of a good reason to share that content other than, you know, well, just because I can share it, I, I can. So let's look at it. Uh, branding, the content you share defines your company. So think before you tweet or go live, you're representing your com company, especially if you're on their, their platform, indeed. Uh, number two, networking. Share content that highlights or involves people from other companies. So you're taking photos of blog visitors, tag them in the photos, watch them share with their followers, that type of thing. Number three, interactivity. Uh, by sharing content and responding to comments and questions, you've begun to see interactivity. So if someone comments, get back to them, say thanks, and maybe ask a question. Number four, uh, engagement is a step above simple interactivity. It's more personal and more responsive. Number five, organic spread. Your content really could go viral. You have no way of knowing this. You can't predict it, you can't plan it, but it could happen. A good piece of content can get legs though, you know? Uh, number six, social proof. If your customers like your material and share it, you've been exposed to more potential customers who may not have previously known you exist. So that's a good thing. Uh, but suddenly they saw it from one of their trusted sources and now you've become a trusted source. Number seven, it humanizes your uh, company by becoming human to your market you become more attractive to them generally speaking number eight uh, caring by sharing you showing that you really do care about others number nine reciprocation if you share something that focuses on another person company or product you know it may complement something uh, you're doing so it makes sense to highlight it these people will feel compelled to do the same for you via reciprocation and number ten sharing drives traffic to your booth at the show, and your blog, and your Facebook page, and your Twitter page, and Instagram, and YouTube channel, and so on. So that's a quick look at uh, this week's trade show tip of the week from the book, Get It on Amazon, along with my other with trade show success. Wrap it up with one uh, good thing. Uh, I ran across a really interesting podcast, historical podcast. I like historical podcasts. I don't know why. There was one called Slow Burn about the Nixon you know, resignation and the whole Watergate thing. That was really fascinating. There's a new one out called Bagman, uh, hosted by Rachel Maddow of MSNBC. It's called Bagman. It's all about Spiro T. Agnew, who basically ran an extortion and bribery enterprise while he was vice president. He did it before in Maryland as governor and before he became governor. 
Uh, a lot of the stuff we didn't know about, we kind of like glossed it over. History has forgotten a lot of that, but this tells the story from people who were there. Really fascinating stuff. It's called Bagman. That is this week's One Good Thing. Check it out. I think uh, from a historical perspective, you'll find it very, very entertaining. All right, that's it. I'm Tim Patterson, Trade Show Guy. Have yourself a great week. Catch you next week on Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee.